Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll and I'd like to welcome you to The Gary Knoll Show. This is the place to turn to if you want to find positive solutions to problems. Well, I have seen so many people who are smart, who are educated, who just make foolish choices. They end up overeating, drinking, they do drugs, they overwork, they have the wrong relationships. How did we get into this problem and how do we solve it? Today, part one of the solutions to so many of your problems called Mastering Your Opposite. Let's watch. Hi, I'd like to welcome you to a special presentation, one that is a part of our Mastering Life series. This series started over 13 years ago and over 100 programs have been done in it up to this point. With each one I try to give different insights of the human condition. The information is meant just as a guide, asking questions, probing assumptions, challenging many of our beliefs with the hope that at the end of this you'll be able to look at life a little differently and hopefully be empowered. Today our discussion is going to focus upon something I feel is very important. It is called mastering our opposite. Now what do I mean? Let me give you an example. Let's say that you're an individual who has worked very hard at your career. Maybe you're a, an artist, uh, a writer, a painter, a graphic artist, a sculptor, a dancer, a poet. But at your heart you feel that you have a life of value beyond just being a mechanic of what you do that the mechanism is merely a way of getting something accomplished. Even the intellectual mechanism is just to get something out and look at it. When you go into a kitchen and you see a chef that has all their ingredients laid out, you don't know what it's going to look like, how it's going to taste. In fact, it's rather surprising to see wonderful dishes at the end of this process. What we make the mistake of doing more often than not is we judge the ingredients at any given time based upon our fears or expectations of what that final product is supposed to be. So what if I'm afraid to fail? What if I'm afraid to create something that's really unique away from the recipe? Just let my mind go and say I'm going to put it together and it's going to taste great. And I have the confidence to be present for that experience. That's not what we do. What we do is we try to master each of the ingredients and how we should feel about them. In effect, we take one piece of an ingredient of life and we become expert at it. Everyone masters something. I've never met a person who didn't. It's not about education. It's not about finances social position. It's about in a world that only respects you if you have established yourself, then what it is that you're going to establish yourself will become an extension of who you are. So now we have a person who wakes up one day and they've created something. They've taken the time and the effort and the energy and the skills to create something. So now they look at their work and they question it. Is it as good as it could be? Is it not as good? How do I know that people will like it or not like it? Maybe it's hard to get started. And now what happens is almost everything necessary to feel good about what they've done, they actually feel bad about it. They actually question themselves. Instead of having jubilation and joy in their experience, they have hesitation. There's a, there's a fear that something's wrong. There's not an authentic connection, and there should be. As hard as people work, the problem is that people have mastered their opposite. So doing more of what you've done won't change anything, and yet that's exactly what we do. Even people who are caregivers try to give more. Well, there's only so much you can give, and there, then there's nothing left to give. People who in a relationship give more attention and time and love and affection, adoration, and then one day they wake up and they still feel nothing authentic. There's not that essential connection. You can only connect with something when it's authentically you and not your opposite. 
If it's your opposite, it's dualistic. The trouble is we frequently misinterpret what is dualism. We'll say, well, the dualistic of, of good is bad. But what if we don't see the world that way? What if we have disguised our opposite? We've only mastered part of what we should and not the totality. Then what has happened is we've taken of 100 ingredients that should go into a recipe, we've taken one or two. We've mastered those two. We know everything about those one or two. What are you going to make with one or two? It's never going to be complete. In your mind it's going to be complete because you're visualized, fantasizing something that you're not creating in reality. All of you have had expectations far beyond the reality of what you've created, right? You've wanted something, whether it's in a relationship or a job or in someone else. You've projected an ideal. Why do you think people project ideals? Because by projecting an ideal, you're protecting the fallibility of the non-ideal. You're protecting what you've mastered. You've mastered the non-ideal. So you think about the ideal. Now think of that for a moment. Do you understand what I just said? When we focus upon doing something because of how we're going to be received, perceived, judged, evaluated, then all of our energy is in mastering the defense mechanism that allows people to see exactly what they want, uh, we want them to see about us, but also it has its opposite end. We master what we don't want people to see about us what we don't want people to know about us. That's mastery. You never tell any, anybody everything about yourself, do you? Because think of all the things you think about that you feel people would not accept or not understand or would fear. So then the opposite of what we want, fulfillment in connecting with something that gives us a sense of belonging, being, has not been mastered. Instead, what we've mastered is a partial self. Here's the good part of me. Here's the part of optimism. Here's the part of jubilance. Here's the part of the, the wonderful poet, the wonderful artist, the wonderful homemaker, the wonderful lover, the wonderful healer, the wonderful caregiver, the wonderful naturalist, the wonderful idealist. Oh, people gravitate to that. Now, you see people like that. You see people are connected to it. So what do you do? You master it. All your energy goes into defending it. And the more fearful you are of surrendering what you've mastered, the greater reaction to anything that challenges it. Reaction is a direct relationship to the fear that you have of full discovery. Do you understand what that means? Yes? No? Okay. Anyone not understand what that means? All right. Let me be a little clearer. Let's say that we, we want people to know us, identify us for what we believe is the most important quality about us, so we really work on that. And then one day we wake up and people have accepted us for that, and we think, wow, you know, they like me for something. We also know that the things in our mind, things in our heart, things in our psyche, that we know people wouldn't like us the same way. So what do we do with that? We can't just let that come out. So what do we do? We hide it. When you hide something, you have to remember where you hid it. Right? You don't want it suddenly opening up in a closet and someone saying, oh, let's look in your psyche. Whoa! That's an ugly thing. I don't want that. And then we have to, no, that's not me. You, you didn't see me in there. And then we start the excuses. Then we get clever enough because we're so good at mastering the limitation of ourselves that we stand psychically in front of anything that causes it to change. Why do you think so many people are overweight and then crash diet and go right back up? Why do you think so many people are, think higher ideals than what they actualize on? Why do you think so many people have ideas of being whole and complete and fulfilled and dynamic and love and lovable, and you don't, don't connect with it? And then they work harder at it. The game is mastering working harder 
for a preferential treatment of yourself and in the eyes of other people. Look, he's working really hard. Give him a break. I mean, look, my God, I mean, she's going to therapy and she's, she's working on herself and she cries a lot and, and he's, you know, he's, he's doing all he can and, and we suddenly, we're, we're led astray because we're thinking that a person's efforts mean they really want to change. No! It's a game. The opposite would be to change. So that's why you can spend years in this wasteland of trying to be someone that you're not. But you have been who you needed to be, and that's what you mastered. You mastered defenses. You mastered uh, exits, what I call the exits of life. How's this work? It works this way. The moment you commit yourself to anything, that means you have to use everything, where you must embrace your fear and be present with it and realize it's not real. You must embrace your limitations and realize it's you alone that should judge that and no one else. You embrace your insecurity and realize the insecurity is a myth, populating people's minds based upon what the preconceived notion of what you can and cannot do. Well, I'm black. I'm old. I'm a woman. I'm Puerto Rican. I'm poor. I'm uneducated. Think of all the excuses that people have used as a rationale for feeling that this is why I'm not, I'm not what? Not loved, not respected. And then one day enough people believe in something and then it becomes a, a truth. And then behind that truth we hide the dysfunctional self, the hidden self. Behind this and stereotypes, behind these cute little things become our exits. So for every step we take forward in life with a challenge, we also have one eye forward on the challenge. Look where we're going. Going to do it this time. Going to work hard. And over here to the left is the exit. But how can you go forward and out the same time? How can you do it? You can't. You can't be at two places simultaneously with the same energy. But we deceive ourselves. And that's why we're so confused. Because we think that the effort we put in, including the emotional effort, the emotions themselves, emoting doesn't change anything, does it? Cry a river of tears over a problem, and what happens to the problem? Nothing. Be afraid of a problem, what happens? Nothing. Fear disempowers. Uncertainty disempowers. And mastering the wrong side of what you need disempowers. So more of the same, changing partners, changing careers, changing locations, changing anything doesn't change you. There's never a circumstance more significant than your life. And yet we try to make circumstances our life. Well, if only, you know, if, on, if only what? Well, if only she would have loved me, if he would have loved me, if I would have had, if I would have made, if they would have bought, if I would have got. That's an excuse. And because those excuses, those excuses become the exit. So when you don't get this, you're going forward to, that you've announced, that everybody's aware of, then you got this. And that was there all along. And that becomes our escape mechanism. So when you escape, the escape is actually intentional, it's methodical, it's premeditated, and it's built into the psyche. Even if you think it's unconscious, there are no unconscious acts. When people say, you know, I wasn't focused. Oh yes, you were. You're just on the wrong thing. I wasn't conscious. Yes, you were. But unconscious on the wrong thing. Think when you don't do something. Think when you lose something. It's because your mind was on something else, not what you were supposed to be focused on. So do we actually say, what can I learn from that? No. Instead, we go ahead and do it again and get angry with ourselves or someone else. And then suddenly circumstances become what bothers us. So I'm suggesting that when you wake up one day and realize that you simply have feared the wrong things, you have feared surrendering completely 
the limited or dysfunctional self, the imperfect self, but everything in life is imperfect. When you get close enough to it, you see the imperfections. But unfortunately, we can't convince ourselves or others that life is imperfect because everyone is judging someone based upon an imperfect value. Just look at what happens when you're 30 and you're judged at one level and you're 40 in a different level and 50 a different level. Three people walking in to get a job, all equally qualified. I can assure you that the 60-year-old or 70-year-old will be the ones first to be disqualified because of their age. It shouldn't be that way. And then you're disqualified based upon how you look. Then you're disqualified based upon all the other limitations that someone has mastered. Racism has to be mastered. It doesn't come naturally. Bias has to be mastered. Bigotry has to be mastered. Prejudice has to be mastered. Fear has to be mastered. You can't be afraid until you've mastered it. You can't be dysfunctional until you've mastered it. And one day you wake up and you are a master of it. Now realize there's a consequence that when you've mastered any limiting factor, any limiting factor, when you've mastered it, its opposite has to be surrendered. You can't master both. So we're all masters of the frequently the wrong energy. Our primal chi is our life force. When we're in balance, it flows. Life is harmonizing. All of our chakras are in rhythm and harmony. We feel good. We feel at ease. <clears throat> we feel that the world around us and our energy are moving at the same level. We can heal with that energy. We can bring in other people's energy. We can connect authentically. And authentic connections mean there's no impediment, there's no barrier. And when you connect with something that's authentic, you feel it. Remember, anything you're working hard on, you're working on the wrong energy. So I know the moment someone says, but I'm working so hard, then they haven't surrendered their opposite. When you're connecting, it is fluid. You're at ease. Being honest should be at ease. Well, if you're not honest, then you're dishonest. Dishonesty requires mastery. And what we do, we are disingenuous because we only show what we feel confident can be accepted in a politically talking system, politically correct talking system, but what we really feel we have to hide. Go back to what I said, we're going to hide anything that will cause it to be judged in the wrong way or harshly. So once again, we can't be honest. We can't say, well, here's what I really think. Here's what I really believe. Here's what I really want to do. Because if we did that, someone says, hold on a second. Uh, we can't accept that. And then we think, OK, what is going to happen now? Am I going to be judged? Will I be thrown out? Will I be excluded? The human condition craves connection. Now take a careful look at what you've connected with and ask yourself, is it real or is it part of your dysfunction? Does it honor you and liberate you or does it condition you? Anything that you have not yet mastered requires patience and compassion. The nice thing about causing choices that end up in disasters, and many are major disasters, is that we can actually benefit from that if we realize that that disaster, by doing something wrong, is a wonderful lesson. Now, you either actively seek the lessons in life, and that requires discipline. To seek a lesson, you must close all exits. Board them up. But you haven't done that. You're always looking for that exit. And one way to get the exit is to get other people to agree with you. So confession, declaration, betrayal of our fear. That's why people betray. They're actually betraying fear. But what if you said there's no option? Exit's not an option. Compromise is not an option. 
I'm going to do this until I do it right. I'm going to work on myself until I get it right. And if I have to go through pain, I will embrace the pain and I'll be present for it. Do you know what it means when something bad happens to you and instead of reacting, instead of getting angry, instead of looking for the exit, you simply stop and you go silent and you're simply present in that moment with what you're experiencing. Just present. When you're simply present, then a language deeper, more meaningful than a verbal message communicates with you. In that silence of just being present, the universal energy comes in. The chi brings that energy in, and you have all that energy to work from. And now you can look at those pro problems in a proper perspective because you're not emotionally attached to the outcome. When you detach the ego from the outcome, then the outcome no longer is something to be alien to you or feared. You're simply aware of what you're doing. Right now, People are in unhappy relationships more often than not and afraid to commit themselves to a true relationship of an authentic connection because they have not mastered the art of being honest to themselves. So they bump from one to another or get stuck in something that is a compromise. So what we do, we adapt to laying on a bed of nails and anesthetize the pain by our distractions. And we think as long as I master something that feels good in my life, I can tolerate the pain of everything that doesn't. And then think about what you master that takes away the pain from what you have not. And that shows you where most people are. And that's why we are sublimating all the time. You wouldn't have a nation of people who gamble and smoke and drink and overwork and complain and whine and moan and blame unless it was pure sublimation of what is not authentic in their life. So that's what we should be looking at, not the end stage of it, not a psychosis or neuroses, not obesity or heart disease or cancer. That's the very end stage of the mastery of your opposite that has a negative consequence. Master the wrong energy, you're going to have all negative consequences. Even though along the way, you may think that you've gotten positive results because almost anything that you work hard at initially, you will get a result that someone will acknowledge. Well, if that were the case that all we have to do is have hard work, then everybody who's a hard worker would be happy. Isn't the case. Everyone who's successful financially or in their careers. But that's not true either. The difference is, think how much those people who are successful at doing something have hidden from themselves and others what they don't want the world to see. Full revelation always is shocking to us. Why should it be? Why should it be shocking when we find out something about someone that we didn't want them to be, like a hero? Oh, we find out they're really human. Well, it's their fault maybe for not allowing us to see how human they were, and it's our fault for projecting upon someone else the ideals that we're not willing to manifest in ourselves. Always be careful around people who need you to be a hero because it means that they're going to blame you for not being a hero. You're their standard instead of them being their own standard. So how can we dis disengage from one energy and master what allows us the freedom to be? Well, first you have to go back in your history. Go back to when you were a little boy or a little girl. What did all little boys and little girls have in common? Huh? Well, for those of you who actually were little boys and girls. <laughs> some of you just grow up as sad-assed adults. But for the rest of us. I'm sure some of you came out of our birthing canal and you were 160 pounds just angry. <laughs> I protest. <laughs> what did what the children have? What, what are you? Innocence, what else? Honesty. Honesty, what else? Playful, Playful. Spontaneous. spontaneous. Joy. Joy. Unpredictable. Unpredictable. Inquisitive. Inquisitive. Curious. 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 And then what do we do? We give them parents. <laughs> and you know the problem of a parent, any dysfunction the parent has generally is the dysfunction of the grandparents, dysfunction of the great-grandparents. They keep passing on the dysfunction because everyone's mirroring the mastery of something else, assuming that it was the right thing to do. Think of how many of our parents smoked and drank thinking it was the right thing to do. They mastered that because it was socially acceptable. You went to a party in the 1940s and 50s as our parents did. You had a drink. You smoked. 
you ate crappy food, and you talk conservative. Right? And you went home anally retentive and hung yourself up in a closet. So, and anything that was its opposite was threatening. Ooh, those long hair. Ooh, remember? Just having long hair was such a threat. People got in fights over it. It became a major issue. Hair. Well, what about Christ's hair? What about Buddha's? Well, not Buddha. <laughs> what about the lack of Buddha? Was something wrong with Buddha? Was he shaving his head? Did he have male pattern baldness? <laughs> what about Abraham and Isaac? Were they hippies? What about the picture of God or goddess? Long hair, ooh, a hippie god. Did he do drugs? <laughs> Did he eat magic mushrooms? Did he skip with <laughs> Timothy Leary? The journey continues till next week on Mastering Your Opposite. I'll see you then.